Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. The Bible says we must repent to God and express our faith in Jesus. Why? This goes back to the different functions they have. You don't repent to the Holy Ghost. I've heard people pray to the Holy Ghost. And the Bible never says to do that. Jesus said, when you pray, say what? Our Father. You read John 17, the prayer of Christ. Six times he said, Father, Father, Father. Six times. I've heard people pray in the name of the Father. Jesus says, pray in my name. Listen to me. <laughs> We must learn to serve God with as much precision as possible. Amen. Sloppy service to God will yield no blessings. You just can't come to God in a disorganized way and say, well, he understands. He does not understand. If God says, pray in the name of Christ, that's what you do. I can't tell you how many times I'm disturbed by well-meaning people. And I mean well-meaning. They're not aware of what they're doing. Father in heaven, uh, grant us a good day. In your name we pray. We must pray in the name of Jesus. Now let's go back to Acts 20, 21. Repentance towards God. Why? Because it is his law that was broken. Faith in Jesus because he paid the penalty for the broken law. Have I lost anyone? Let me say it again differently. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Whether it's a deliberate sin or an ignorant sin, the penalty is death. You see, the law of God doesn't care if you sin deliberately or ignorantly. A sin is a sin. Now, God in his mercy does not hold us responsible when we sin ignorantly. But I've told you before, I'll tell you again. To sin ignorantly, we must be able to say to God, I did not know. What's the other thing we must be able to say? I had no way of knowing. That is ignorance. But ignorance does not fall under 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of. That's not ignorance. That's presumption. That's disrespect. And that's suicide. And so the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's what the law demands, death. And God hates sin. And so we read in Ephesians 5, verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things come of the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. The wrath of God comes upon the children of disobedience. Disobedience is sin. Disobedience is violating God's law. It is upon those that the wrath of God is poured out. But Jesus on that cross, he took that wrath. Are you following me? He died the death. Everything the Father required to satisfy his anger against sin, not against us, against sin, Jesus took. And so the Father cursed Christ on the cross. Galatians 3.13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. Listen, this is very serious. When Christ was on that cross, the Father backed off from him and allowed all the demons of hell to do whatever they wanted with him because of sin he was cursed by God he was made a sinner by God and God finally turned away and Jesus knew he had turned away that's why he said why hast thou forsaken me because Christ said I can't lie I'm the truth so when God turned away Jesus felt it and he cried out and so the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 when he had by himself purged our sins because the disciples had run the father forsake him the Holy Ghost forsake him the angels forsook him when he had by himself and he took the wrath of the father he suffered the death for us now what we have is here's a God who has been offended by sin because sin is a personal attack against God so David said, against thee, the only have I sinned. He didn't say against Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba. 
He said, against thee, the only have I sinned. When the wife of Potiphar wanted to lead Joseph into sin, he said, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against Potiphar? Is that what he said? Against God. Let me tell you, sin is a personal attack against God. And God will always defend himself. And so God has wrath against sin. Jesus took that wrath. He took the wrath for the entire world. And he died. He suffered the wrath first, you see, then he died. The Bible says in Hebrews 2.9, Christ tastes death for every man. To taste death, you have to be alive because the dead know nothing. Ah, that went over your head. I saw it flying over your head. Let me try it again. The Bible says in Hebrews 2.9 that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. In other words, to experience, to feel it. To feel something, you have to be alive. Because the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 9.5, the dead know nothing. Therefore, the tasting of death is what Christ suffered in Gethsemane. You see, what happened on the cross happened to people all the time. A crucifixion was a common thing. Are you with me? What happened in Gethsemane, no one else had ever experienced. Mm. Did you get it? No, you didn't. Let me tell you again. Was Christ crucified alone, yes or no? Was he crucified alone, yes or no? No. Were there two crucified men with him? Yes. You looked at the three men, you couldn't tell the difference. They were all hanging on the cross, waiting to die. Hmm? It was common. What happened in the Garden of Gethsemane was uncommon. And he began to sweat through his skin, blood, as he felt this weight. It was so terrible that God sent an angel, Luke 22 from verse 41 to 44. God sent an angel to strengthen him. God sent no angel when he was on the cross. Because every man could take the cross. Ah. Listen to me, taking the cross was not a big thing. I can be crucified, <laughs> and I'll take it. I can't do what Christ suffered in that garden. All of that Christ took, that suffering. Then he died. He gave up his life. Then he came back. Did you hear what I said? Now the Bible says over and over the Father raised him. The Father raised him because he came up at the command of the Father. But Jesus raised himself. You didn't hear me. I said, Jesus raised himself. If the Father had, you see, Jesus said in Hebrews 1, 3, the Bible says, when he had by himself purged our sins, needed, Christ does not need help to save us. To save us from what? Come on, talk to me. Save us from what? Which is what? Death. The final enemy is death. Christ saves us from sin, which leads to death. Sin has death in it. Now, for Christ to save us from death, which is the penalty for sin, he must demonstrate his power over death by himself raising himself, not seeking help to get out of the grave. Because if the Father had raised him, we would have had a Savior who needs to help, who needs help to save us. Are you with me? Are you with me? Jesus saves us by himself. No one has to help me get up from the grave, says Christ. I get up, I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. Destroy this temple, and in three days, I'll rise again. The Father commanded it, and when Christ obeyed the Father, which was all the time, the Father took credit for what he did. Are you with me? That's a powerful lesson for us. When you obey God, God says, I did that. Mm, you missed that. <laughs> ah, that's how we're one with God. When God called Abraham, the Bible says, I took Abraham. When the Israelites were disobedient to God, God said, Moses, those people you brought up. <laughs> Are you with me? When they were obedient, he said, the people I brought up. Hmm? When you obey, God says, I did that. It's a powerful teaching to know that God is so proud of what we've done. He claims it as his. And it's not divine plagiarism, by the way. Because God can claim it because we did it by his power. Are you with me? So Jesus rose at the Father's command. So the Bible says the Father raised him. Now, 
So Jesus lived the sinless life. If he had not lived the sinless life, his death would have been useless. Are you with me? He had to conquer sin in life, conquer death, conquer the grave. Now, all of that is the basis on which the Father can forgive us. Are you with me? All that Christ did, the entirety and fullness of his atonement, which includes his life, not just the fact he lived and breathed, but the hardness of his life. All the trials and sufferings, the harassment he got from the rulers of the church, all of that is part of the atonement. His death, voluntary death, his tremendous resurrection, all of that. On the basis of that, the Father can forgive you and me for having broken his law. So Jesus died to satisfy the Father and the law. Of course, the law expresses the Father's character. Now, that's why we must repent towards God. Father, I broke your law. I am sorry. But I accept the sacrifice of Christ. I believe that what he did is sufficient for you to forgive me. And I come to you holding on to that sacrifice. And when you do that, you don't come to God as a father. You know, I, I am a deaconess and I teach a Sabbath school class. Forgive me. Mm -mm. There's nothing you can do of yourself or I that cuts any ice with God. Well, let me clear that expression, cut ice. My internet friends may not understand what I'm saying. There's nothing you and I can do that impresses God. It has no merit whatsoever. All our righteousness, finish it. Now, the verse doesn't say all our sins are like filthy rags. That's too obvious. Even our righteousness. <laughs> the only acceptable thing we can do in God's eyes has to be done through Christ. And so the Bible says, repentance towards God, Father of heaven, I have broken your law. I am sorry. Forgive me because of what Jesus did. And when we come in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus represents his sacrifice, his atonement, his sinless life, his divinity, his everything. That's the name of Christ. Not just J-E-S-U-S. -S. There are many people in Spanish countries called Jesus. Same thing. So it's not J-E-S-U-S. -S. It is all that the name stands for. The atoning sacrifice of Christ, which not only makes us safe, it makes the entire universe safe. Hmm. Ah, my brothers and sisters, when you break God's law, the Father's law, who pays the penalty for that broken law? The Son. And who convicts you and me that we have broken the Father's law? The Holy Spirit. Let me tell you something. It is all what? A family affair. The secret place I found in you, O Lord. A quiet place to lay my broken life. In you I know I dwell in love and safety. In time of storm abiding in your calm. such as I